All right, so uh, feel free to take it away and uh, let's uh, and thank you students and thank you, Brian, for uh, presenting. It's uh, we really appreciate it. Well, again, first of all, it's it's my pleasure. And, and I do hope in the end we, we do spend some time because I do have a few questions that I'd like to ask. And, you know, it would really be interesting to to hear what you all have to say. Uh, it is nice to see everybody again. I, I think I recognize all of you guys from when we were doing the contest. But as it, we said, you know, my name is Brian Rist. And today I'm excited to share with you my entrepreneurial journey with you. Over 30 years ago, I started a small company in Fort Myers, Florida called StormSmart. Hold on one second, a little audio problems here. Today it stands as the largest producer of hurricane protection products in the country. It employs over 450 people, people. And although the journey wasn't easy, it was it grew into something that was far more successful than anything I could have ever dreamed of. I, I truly pinch myself every day. Storm Smart is one of the largest employers in Southwest Florida and has been for almost two decades. During my tenure at Storm Smart, we were selected by Inc. Magazine five different times as one of the fastest growing companies privately held companies in the United States. We received multiple awards, both locally and in some cases nationally, for many of its accomplishments. In 2023, StormSmart completed over 9,000 unique projects, most of which were in Southwest Florida. We recently learned that the products we produced and the work we done, the jobs we completed, protected over 100,000 homes in Southwest Florida during the recent hurricane Ian that we experienced. Today, in front of you stands somebody that I really truly believe is one of the luckiest people you may ever meet. For more than 26 years, I got to do something that I truly loved. I got to work with a group of amazing people I was able to do something I absolutely loved every single day. Today, if it's okay, I'd like to share with you a few of the lessons I learned along the way, which I believe made us successful and allows me today to live a life that can really only be described as the American dream. By following these few basic concepts and through a lot of hard work, I now get to live a life where I get to do things I really enjoy. I get to travel to some amazing places and I spend some of my time as an adjunct professor in Fort Myers teaching students about some of the lessons I've learned and how they made me to who we are today and I believe the life you leave, see, I, I believe the life you leave is associated with the lessons you teach. And education is and should be a lifelong commitment. It all starts with why. You, your business just has to have a higher purpose. If your core mission is in starting your business, is focused on making a lot of money. Sadly, I'm here to tell you that it probably won't be sustainable. There must be a higher purpose behind your, your plan. In my case, when I started our business, started our company, we had a mission of making Florida a safer place in the event of the next hurricane. Everything we did, products we created, processes we put in place, everything focused on our mission. And today, it remains our top priority. Every employee's job from top to bottom centers on this goal, from the time they come to work in the morning until the time they leave at night. By keeping that focus intact, the money follows. However, if we had been focused only on revenue, I guarantee you, I'd not be here speaking to you today. Next comes perseverance. Starting a business with limited capital 
and no formal business plan was daunting. In our early years, our financial struggles were basically our constant companion. I remember a mentor one day telling me, Brian, businesses don't fail, people quit. Those words kept me going. We faced dark days, but perseverance was our guiding light. We pushed through and today, StormSmart is one of the largest manufacturers in Southwest Florida. So when you're experiencing dark days and of your own, and you will, remember those few words, businesses don't fail, people quit. And get back to work. You gotta persevere. Perseverance is like the most important part. The next lesson I'd like to share with you is is in the importance of giving back. A great lesson I learned in life is that when you give for the right reason and with the right heart, it always comes back to you in some amazing ways. Whatever your beliefs are, this lesson has been proven to me and being reinforced to me countless times. I mentioned earlier that I'm one of the luckiest people you'll ever meet. But this does not mean the journey was easy. In, in the beginning of 2010, just when we really started our business and our business was growing, we faced one of the biggest challenges any business could ever face. One day, I remember while I was opening the mail, I received some legal documents, which turned out in the end to be some, a, a cease and desist order from somebody that I had never even heard of. They were claiming our flagship product, which was our storm catcher screens, were infringing on a patent that they claimed to have filed. Now, we felt it was completely meritless, and but we had to take it seriously. So we had to defend ourselves and or face the real possibility of being put out of business or even worse, having you to work for them. I'd already learned that hiring an attorney is very expensive, but what I was about to learn was hiring a patent attorney was even more expensive. But we had no choice. We had to hire an intellectual property attorney and we chose one out of Miami. The legal battles went on for over two years. In the end, we would spend less than one day in court, but we spent over $2 million on legal fees, which we simply just didn't have. During this title, entire battle, we only went to court one day, yet we had a, a, an entire room full of legal pleadings. See, I later learned that there's this closet occupation. It's called patent jumpers. People who claim and make a living attacking companies claiming, about, claiming they're doing a patent infringement. Their whole strategy is to paper you to death with the hopes that you'll surrender under all the mounting legal fees and all the costs they, get, they send at you. And then they kind of come in and collect damages and swoop in and pick up whatever pieces are left over. I'll never forget another day when again I was opening the mail. And this time it was from my attorneys in Miami. And I noticed this large envelope. And when I opened it up, it was their bill for one month. That bill for one month was over $107,000. It was an amount we simply just couldn't afford. This legal battle went on for two years. It required me to spend a large amount of almost all my time 
in energy, defending our company and the 63 employees we had at that time. This came at a time when we really had an opportunity to really grow, but I could barely focus on my company, let alone continue to develop new ideas and innovative products. Something just had to give. Our company was in dire, extreme jeopardy. I faced a very real possibility of having to tell our employees who had trusted in me so much that their jobs were going to end. It was taking a tremendous toll on me, my company, my family, and, and it just personally, I, it was something just had to give. Then I remember one day when things were really the darkest, I remember waking up one morning and watching the news. And there was a story on the news about this woman. We lived in Cape Coral, Florida at that time. There was a story on the news about this woman whose brother, she was taking care of her brother who was ill and they had fallen on hard times. So bad that they ran out of money and they didn't even have enough money to pay their water bill. And I thought to myself, we, we live in paradise, but how can these people possibly live a life where they didn't have running water in their house? They didn't have money to even pay their water bill to take a shower or brush your teeth. We'd done a lot of advertising with some of the local media people. So I decided that I was going to do something about it. And I got a hold of somebody at the TV station. I said, look, I don't want to go on TV. I don't want no part of this. I just want to know who these people are and how much money they need to get back on firm ground. It turned out they needed $137 to pay their water bill. So they told me where they live. I went over that afternoon and I paid, I gave this woman $137 so she could get her water turned back on. And it was extremely emotional. I mean, she just couldn't believe that a stranger, someone she didn't know would give her that money, but I paid her water bill. So then I went on my day and I went out to dinner that night. And just before we were sitting down to have dinner, my phone rings. And it was my very expensive attorney from Miami. And he said, hey, Brian, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah, I'm getting ready to have dinner. And he said, I didn't want to tell you this a week ago, but over the last two weeks, we've been fighting with your insurance company. And one of the charges that are involved in your patent case is false advertising. And your liability insurance covers you in, against false advertising. So what that meant was my insurance company was going to pay for all my legal expenses going forward and also repay us for all the money and my lawyer's fees going backwards. So now I wasn't fighting that those people anymore, the people who were trying to put us out of business. Now they're fighting the insurance company who had much deeper pockets than I, and they no longer could win that case. So I'm not here to tell you that two plus two equals four, but as I said before, when you give for the right reason and with the right heart, it comes back to you in multiple ways. And in multiple times, that's happened to me. From that day forward, we've been on a different mission. We're working towards a much higher cause. And honestly, we've never done better. So that's how I started this whole giving back thing. Now, if we fast forward a few years, one of the added benefits of receiving awards from people like Inc. Magazine and being selected by them is you get on the radar of some very large companies, uh, a lot of investment banking companies and private equity companies and investment bankers. So after returning from one of those Inc. Magazine awards, I decided it was time to listen to what they had to say. That started about a four year journey of putting our company into a position 
where it may be something that that somebody would be interested in, attractive to and, and, and be interested in be acquired. This was no easy task. And it came at a time when we were still growing rapidly. And we were basically bursting at the seams. Like many first generation companies who have experienced rapid growth, we were, let's say it nicely, not exactly properly structured. We had not done a great job of documenting our processes and or keeping our books, well, they were far from bulletproof. And I understand some of the details we would have to go through. They would be intense and a, at a level of sophistication that we simply weren't at and we didn't have the talent needed. So we were, at that time, so I had grown the company to a point close to the top of my ability. I knew that if I wanted to make our business grow further, first, I'd have to grow. So I decided to go back to school, go back to Lowell, and eventually earn my MBA. This decision had an almost immediate positive impact on me and personally, but the business even more. It seemed like each course I took was extremely relevant to the opportunities and challenges I was facing in my day-to-day -day business. We quickly started to work towards becoming more structured, implementing state-of-the-art software, and we started streamlining our processes and procedures. We started putting in place documentation we should have had years earlier, making StormSmart a much leaner company. Change, is, it's, it's just never easy. There are many tough decisions we were forced to make. Often you find that some of the people who helped you get to where you are, sadly, are not the people who can get you where you want to go. I had to make a lot of tough decisions. As I looked around our company, I realized that in many cases, StormSmart was the biggest company most of us had ever worked for. While this made them extremely loyal and great employees, they just simply didn't know what they didn't know. I had, I had to make some decisions. If I wanted to get our company to where I wanted it to go, I had no choice but to bring in some different talent. I needed leadership who had been through the battle that we were about to go through, the process we were about to undertake. None of this happened overnight. In fact, it took a couple of years. None of this was easy, simple, but if I wanted to make this thing happen, changes just had to be made. We later made the decision to hire an investment banking company to guide us through the acquisition process. We chose one of the largest and most established in the country. I'm a firm believer that in business, in life, you get what you pay for. It's not usually really wise to hire the cheapest people to help you. It's not a good strategy. It's not a good idea to hire, uh, let's say, the least expensive heart surgeon. It usually is not smart to hire the cheapest attorney. I learned the same thing is true, is certainly true when it comes to investment banking. You want the best team in the private equity business. It's all about who they know, who will take their calls, 
and who they've already dealt with and done business with and who has the history of getting deals done. Time went on, then one day I remember, it was a little more than three years ago, after many months of planning and hard work, a private equity company made us an offer far greater than anything I've ever dreamed of. And today, they own the majority of my company. And I have the great fortune to do things like this. You often hear horror stories about private equity companies. They buy up companies and they tear them apart. They fire all the key staff and destroy the culture of a company. This couldn't be anything farther from what happened in my life. Today, Storm Smart is almost double in size since they acquired it. It has, if anything, it has probably a greater culture now than when I owned it. They've expanded to multiple locations and, and the employees, they, they seem happier now and more satisfied now and they earn more now than ever before. With some of the money and the processes that we, from the processes, we funded a foundation. We call it the Riz Family Foundation. So we can continue to focus on giving back. Just trying to do our part to make this world a better place. We decided to focus primarily on education. I believe that the only true way to solve problems is through education. You want to solve the hunger problem? Teach people how to farm better, more effectively, how to preserve food longer, and how to conserve precious resources. You want to solve the crime problem? Teach people more, instruct people more about the value of life and the enormous rewards of doing the right thing. You want to solve poverty? Teach people more about the value of working, teaching skills that will help them earn an income. Teach them, teach everyone about economics so they understand how to conserve their monies. Teach them, teach them budgeting so they don't spend more money than they, they earn and they'll have money left over for a rainy day. I'm immensely proud that in the last three years, we helped fund five different unique educational programs. Obviously, my proud one is the Risk Difference Maker Program. And we also funded the Risk Institute for Sustainability and Energy, both at UMass Lowell. We funded the Risk Institute for, an Entrepreneur, for Entrepreneurship at FGCU, which is in Fort Myers. We also funded the Risk Respiratory Therapy Laboratories and Classrooms at Florida Southwest College, also in Fort Myers. And we recently funded the Risk Institute for Cybersecurity, again, at Southwestern College in Fort Myers. See, I mentioned earlier, I believe education is a lifelong experience. We believe that it's everyone's job to leave this place better when we leave than when we got here. And for me, there's few far things in life more rewarding than to walk into a classroom or to meet someone on the street and know you had a hand in helping them improve their lives. In closing, I'd like to leave you with just a few thoughts. The first one is this, and this is all from Simon Sinek. People don't care what you do until they know why you do it. 
They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And most importantly, always remember, businesses don't fail, people quit. I'd like to thank you for listening to me. I, I hope you found some lessons as valuable as I have. And always remember, just never quit. Thank you. You're not going to throw tomatoes or anything? <laughs> no, Brian, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. It was great to sort of hear the story from your perspective and, and the way you broke it out into these different phases. I, I'm sure these guys have questions, but I'm thinking it might be helpful for them just to introduce themselves. And sure. Just remind Let's go with you that. It's been a while. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I see, Levon, you have your hand up. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell, tell Brian a little bit about what you're working on? First, you got to go off of mute. And Uh, thank you. Hey, Christian, testing from the spring 2024 Difference Maker. Mm -hmm. My team was the same. So, Levon was having some issues earlier today. Uh, so it's, it's for, yeah, testing in order. Levon, we're unable to hear you. I think you're having some uh, network issues, it looks like. Maybe Levon <laughs> could type his message in the chat. Yeah, uh, box type so it in. Get, there. get to it, yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe, Ahmed, do you want to introduce yourself while Levon's doing that? Uh, definitely. Hey, Brian. Hey, everyone. Uh, Brian, first of all, I just want to thank you. Uh, thank you for, for you hear me for time, most importantly. Um, I'm a graduate from UMass Lowell. I finished, I'm a double E major. Um, really, the startup that I started is called EduX or EDUX for, for some people. Um, and really what EduX is about is, to your points that you've discussed, is about education, about educating more students, specifically high school and university students, to educate them about their scheduling to make sure that mm -hmm. they can graduate on time. I um, remember that, yeah. yeah. And so we have a lot of great discussions. We have a lot of ongoing negotiations and partnerships that we're looking to make with UMass Lowell. Um, a lot of high school students that we're, you know, that we're currently working with, we're part of UMass Lowell CCA effort. Um, and we're really bullish on, on hitting Marty Meehan's uh, 2000 goal this year. Um, so definitely looking forward to hitting that goal this year. Yeah, thanks for being so let me ask you this. Tell me what do you think your biggest challenge is right now? What what what's holding you back at this moment? Is it time? Is it money? Is it what is it? The biggest one is is establishing trust with a lot of the with a lot of the students that we have in a lot of the universities. Look, I'm a double E major. I come from a cybersecurity background in the DOD. Um, and it's it's definitely a big proponent of of the United States. It's about ensuring that students' data is secure security protocols are met um, and they're auditing us nonstop. They're asking these questions nonstop. And that's really where a lot of the resistance comes from UMass Lowell as we anticipated. Um, but as we have these discussions, as we've, we, I just got an email from Digital Ocean. We've secured our contract with them. Um, so we're planning to forward that over to UMass Lowell. Um, and hopefully if they can draft a letter of support we can really start working. We can accelerate working with a lot of UMass Lowell students and working with the registrar departments. So it just goes back to that same thing. It's about perseverance. Sometimes yeah. you just have to have a track record. Yeah. You know, you, you bring in up, um, you know, testimonials and third party endorsements and things like that. Sometimes nothing makes up for just just laying the foundation a little, little longer. And then the concrete starts to, to, to bond and, and, and then it goes and, you know, one thing is, if it was easy, anybody could do it. So yeah. by sticking at it and, and continuing to work at it, then then you've got yourself something. So just just keep fighting. Definitely. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Shuram, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for for the story. Um, that's yeah, really yeah. Um, 
definitely some yeah definitely something my uh yeah my my parents tell me too that it's and and, and the people and that i and that i hear a lot from shark tank too that yeah right right it's not hard yeah it's hard it's hard and long but um it but it but the hard work's part of the process just got to get the job done um and that yeah and that you need to have a purpose you need to have a reason to help other you need to have a reason to help others you can you can go the kevin route but also you got to yeah, but 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 also you gotta um you gotta have a reason to help out other people. Um, you absolutely do, and then it just seems to work better. You know, when you when you're doing something that is making the world a better place or, or making your part of the world a better place, it just seems to work better. It's I, I'm here to tell you, you know, it, and it's difficult because you you are all just starting out. It just can't be about money. It has to be something greater. And then you'll see it go and do it. Sure, you need money. You'll have bills and employees and things you have to pay for and buildings and rents and all those things. You obviously have to make money, but it really has to be about trying to make the world a better place, trying to solve a problem, trying to do something that does that. And then it kind of all fits into, into a portion. And then your team gets behind you a little bit more and, and it really takes off. So Yeah. Yeah, kind of going off of that. Uh, sorry, Levon. Um, uh, yeah, just one, just one sec. Um, it, it's um, yeah, my I, I'm uh, I'm part of the team. Ravi, uh, Ravi would sense for robotic system for the visually impaired. We're making a seeing eye robot for the visually. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's perfect. You're trying to solve a problem. Yeah. You know, for somebody who really needs some help. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so yeah, and, and cause right now, since we're still in the we're still in the product development phase, we're just still yeah. trying to gauge our we're we're still trying to gauge our target our our uh, target audience. And um, yeah, I wanted to yeah I, I I want I want to ask um, when did you start um yeah when when did you start reaching out to uh pe to start reaching out to people for um for uh to, to yeah to for reaching out for partnerships uh in in the in the process of your business uh yeah in the process see we did a little differently we bootstrapped our whole business ours was was a little different we didn't have in you know, this huge r d cost that you you have when you're trying to develop a robotics thing i mean we had some r d issues that and we we developed we pioneered and we patented some products but they were relatively low low expense products so outside of my wife i never had partners i never and we didn't we bootstrapped it away too we were selling a consumer product that we'd go and, and sell to people and then we get a deposit every time we sold it and we use that money to kind of roll the company so we never did go the private uh funding method and, and uh, you know the angel funds and all that stuff that we didn't go that way when I sold my company, we were a debt-free company, and I had no partners, other than my wife, and maybe the school. I don't know, you know. So, <laughs> so it was a little different, but but it, but it's the same. In the end, it, it's kind of the same. You you know you 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 don't want to give away too much, because then they they own you instead of you own the company, and so you just got to be careful how you do that. But sure. you need money to to you know to get things going, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Joshua, do you want to introduce yourself? I think I might know him a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again for your generous contribution to Sparkcell. Um, it was a pleasure to work with the Difference Maker uh, Idea Challenge. Um, you're probably familiar with Sparkcell, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. optical emission spectroscopy tool based. Uh, on the idea of chloride and now pyrotite detection in concrete. Okay. Okay. See, I can I, I came from the construction world. Okay. So that stuff made a, you use a lot of big words, but we 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 did and do a lot of testing of concrete all the time because we're installing hmm. products in mostly commercial buildings that require understanding that. And because I'm Florida, I'm from Florida the degradation of concrete is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. oh, God, and yeah. I, mean, I think it was yesterday or the day before was the three year anniversary of that tragedy in Miami. And, and really that's a, that's a huge bridge, right? problem. No, the uh, condo. Oh, okay. 
As right, a, the condo, the collapse in the middle of the night, and I mm -hmm. forget how many. It was all. It, I don't remember how many people were were lost, but it was a terrible yeah. thing. But throughout, all the way up the east, most of the east coast of Florida, all the way up the east coast of the United States, you have this mm -hmm. tremendous problem of, of of concrete going degrading, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's probably not the last one that's going to be a tragedy. So that stuff that you're yeah. doing is is very relevant to what I do. I was doing. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, yeah. What company were you working with? At a when, ooh, the company we owned. Oh, really? The company we own is called Storm Smart. And, oh, and I still, no, it, oh, wait, Storm Smart's doing. What about the concrete do you guys use for installing the doors um, with Storm Smart? Well, we, we would do is we would hire different engineering firms to do surveys of the concrete. Uh, floors so that we knew what we were drilling into and okay. we knew that the integrity of the, of the of the floor or the concrete was significant so that it could withstand the loads we were about to transfer to oh so is that important for like when you guys are installing lugs into it in order to install? yeah okay absolutely yeah. yeah okay all right that and, makes sense and so what happens in a lot of cases now is in, it's it's basically going to be a, a law very soon for that every, I forget the year, every five years, somebody has to certify the concrete um, in between the floors to make sure they don't have degradation so that they can, they, they, they're sure that they're safe. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger opportunity in one way. It's, it's, it's certainly a safety issue. Yeah. And so that's why when you were talking about that night, I, I understood it so well because we uh, we do core sampling and things like that all the time. Okay, it's incredible. Yeah, I, I I was sorry. Keep going. Oh, so I was surprised to see just how many different industries uh, utilized concrete testing. And You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. Yeah, the real it's estate. It's a huge. Market. It's a yeah. huge business, and people are only starting to understand the the importance of doing it because now that these high-rise buildings are getting older this becomes very very critical to make sure they stay safe and mm -hmm. now we know that all those holes we were drilling for railings and all these other things years ago wasn't too bright and it caused a lot yeah. of problems where the water got into the fasteners and the fasteners got into the rebar or, or into the yeah. mesh and and because because a lot of the buildings, most of those buildings are are post tension buildings, and so <laughs> you got to make sure how that all works out. I see. And then the water inf infiltrates. You, you 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 put a railing in, or even in our case, shutters or windows or, or doors in, and you mm -hmm. drill into the concrete. And if you don't seal that hole correctly, water will inf inf infiltrate into it, and then it mm -hmm. gets down into the masonry, and eventually gets to the, con the to the steel, and mm -hmm. then the problem starts. Exactly. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. It's it's uh, probably a bigger opportunity doing that than other things that you've been thinking about. Yeah, I didn't even think about like inspection of buildings after hurricanes or or storm surges. Yeah, you you need you need to thank David for inviting me here, and I just started a whole new opportunity yeah. for you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> right. So, Levon, is your is your um is your voice working now? Your um, audio? Yeah, I think it should be better now. That was my Wi-Fi. Yeah. It like yeah. dropped me out of the meetings. Right. But so my I... question is Go ahead. Go ahead. pretty simple sounding, but it's a very complex question. So I almost feel bad for asking it. No. But how do you hire good employees? You know, hiring good employees, it's a, it's is probably one of the most important and challenging parts of running a business. Because as you grow, you realize you can't do everything. So there, you go through different cycles during this whole time. I can tell you when we first started out, hiring the next, the second employee was, was different than what we do today. But what in the beginning, I wanted to hire somebody who was different than me. Because I didn't, where I'm more of a sales and marketing guy, I didn't need another sales and marketing person. I needed somebody who had the opposite skills that I had. So, so it started with that. 
and so that's where we first start out. Then as time moved on, we would hire on the basis of attitude, aptitude, and attendance. We, I didn't expect you to know what we did because we wanted to teach you that. We wanted to make sure you had a great attitude and aptitude and you'd show up every day. So then we started hiring for that way. We felt it was our job to hire great people and make them greater. So we often paid for education and, and training for our employees so that they could grow. You, If you hire a, a bunch of people and put them to work and think they're gonna continue to grow, you're, you're mistaken. That's not gonna happen. You have to give them the, the, the secret sauce to, that makes them grow. Most of the time, a lot of times that secret sauce is, a, is further education. We looked for people who were team players. We looked for people who could sing the same song as we sang. We didn't need people who were gonna fight us all the time, but we would hire somebody and then it, we felt it was our job to make them better. But, but by doing some of the things I talked about, but by having a higher purpose and by building a great team and, and, and doing good things, it's easier to get people to want to come to work for you. Nobody, you know, most people just don't today, especially don't come to work for you just because you get paid a certain amount of money or $10 more than somebody else. It, that's, it's just not about that. It, that's because then if that, if they come to you work for you because they make $10 more than they're making today, then the next time somebody offers them $10 more than you're paying them, they'll leave. That's not how to do it. You have to create an environment that helps them grow and makes them better so that they have their life continues to improve. And then people come to you and want to go to work for you. We often, a lot of the people we hired came from one of two places. Most of the time they came from, they were friends or related to somebody who already worked for us. And in a lot of cases, we hired a lot of our customers because we'd come out and do it, do a, a great job and they'd want to come to work for us. One of the things I was, another one of the things I was most proud of about StormSmart was that 64% of all the customers we, all the business we did last month, last quarter, last year was because it was a referral-based business because we did somebody's mother, brother, sister, or cousin. And that is why, how we built our business. So it's all about great customer service. So we create an environment that people wanted to come to us in. It isn't money. Yes, you have to pay them a fair wage. No doubt about it. But you really get them by, by having good things. I'll tell you, and, and I talked to David about this the other day, a lot has to do with networking. It's so important that you get involved in, in networking. So you know other people in, in your industry and, and just meet other people. And, and that's how you meet them. When you hire because you placed an ad in a newspaper or online or something, chances are that that's probably not going to be the best employee in the world. But if you meet somebody at some kind of function and they're out talking to other people, that's where you hire a lot of great people, especially when you get past the production people and get involved in management or, or hire. And, and so we would, most of them were referenced to us more than anything else. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that was good. Thank you. And also a uh, 54% referral rate. that I think like speaks to what you said. That's really impressive. And, and truly, I mean, we're, we were in a consumer business, so it's a little different depending on what, what business you're in. But if you're going to do it, if you're going to be in business, do it the right way. You, you want, if you have to buy new leads every single day, it gets very expensive. The best advertisement for your company is your existing and prior customers. And you should always do that. You're going to have to go take care of them sooner or later anyways, because that's the law. Why not do it right the first time? Then ask them, hey, you know, anybody, anybody else that might benefit by using our products? You know, Josh, in your business, it's going to be huge because there's only a few people who really have those buildings and do it, whether homeowners associations or hmm. condo associations or engineering firms. Mm -hmm. It's all about 
getting referrals. And that's how you build your business. Okay. So now I have a question for you, you guys. I got a couple, two questions for you guys, really. Yep. And one is, let's talk a little bit about AI. Mm. How many people, by raise your hand, do you use AI every day? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and what do you use it for? I, well, I more so use machine learning as a diagnostic right. tool right. Uh, when characterizing spectra. Okay. Devon, what do you use it for? Like everything, sometimes you're trying to find something on Google and it's just a better alternative, has like a more specific answer. And then obviously you need to fact check it. You can't just sure. trust whatever garbage it spits you out, but sometimes it can just point you in the right direction or lead to an idea that you wouldn't have even thought of. Anybody else get an idea what, what they use AI for? I'm building AI right now. And to do what? Text to sound design for content creators. Okay, that's very cool. So my next part, part B of that same question is, how are you learning AI? Are you learning it through the school? Are you learning it on your own? Are you going to YouTube? How are you learning how to use AI? I'm learning from YouTube tutorials. Right. And a little side projects. Right. Research papers, stuff like that. I have, I have researchers here. Uh, I'm at MIT right now and okay. collaborating. Devon, how are you learning it? Sorry, did you call me? Yeah, how, how are you learning how to use AI? I guess a combination of like friends and family, but also just like I'm always exposed to it in the modern society and environment and you just like pick up on that kind of stuff and it subconsciously kind of makes its way into your brain when you're around it long enough. So let me ask you this question, true or false? I wish UMass Lowell or MIT taught more courses in artificial intelligence. True or false? Well, like, that's a really wide range. What do you mean? Like in just how you can apply it to make your life easier or what can you do with it? How, how about how to how to write proper prompts? Yeah, I think emails low one of the classes should be in Python. That, that's a good point. Yeah. Ahmad. Uh yeah, Brian, I think it's a great question. I definitely do agree that UMass Lowell should put a big emphasis on AI and teach students how to do AI. I think UMass Lowell should also hold a couple workshops to get students interested in terms of its application. Um, I think EduX is more than happy to, to promote these AI classes, Brian. Um, okay, I think the people are, uh, there's some people on this call that might have some influence on it. So I have a different question for you. You know, the Difference Maker program, how we all know each other and what we're doing here today is all part of Difference Makers. And one of the ways you continue to grow programs is, is, is all about what I, how I grew my business. You talk to your customers and see what they had to say, what they liked about the program, what they didn't like about the program, and how they could make it better. So if I said to you guys, pretend you are President Chen or Chancellor Chen, and you can do something different with difference makers. What would you do? Do you have any ideas? You got to say something nice. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we would really like to hear this. So please do jump in and don't be shy. Right. Ideally, uh, ideally, probably making uh, pr probably a uh, meeting in person, I guess. But that's just for this camp. Um, and uh, probably. I feel I feel like um working with others to uh get more yeah to get more leads uh yeah work working more closely to get more leads and uh in um for, for our certain for our fields and also also kind of making sure that we do the camp I, I feel I feel like making sure um may, maybe doing the camp after we finish developing this de developing the product might be helpful because then we'd be able to, because 
since this is since a huge emphasis i feel like was working on your business plan and working on working on reaching out to people and uh getting engaging your cust and engaging your uh target markets then i feel like yeah finishing the design first and then going on to the uh camp would be helpful do you, do you know what happens when you finish making your design oh yeah Th then you can't get any more new uh can't get any more new uh customers well you, you, yeah you you i mean I, I pioneered our product probably almost 20 years ago. Okay. And this morning I had a call about, I don't even know, iteration 19 or something. We can, you continue, oh, you have to continue to develop your product. Yes, you need a product to bring to market. But once you bring plan part version one to market, the next thing you're gonna do if you're, if you're wise is you're gonna start working on version two, version three. You're always going to be trying to improve your product forever and ever, especially because the things you guys are doing are fairly complex. So there's all new technology, new things that, so you. So I hear what you're saying and, and I agree, but always, always, always be trying to improve your product. Okay. But let's say with and that kind of brings us back to difference makers. We have a product, I think we all like it, but how can we make it better? Oh, I see. Josh, you took a big part in it. I'm sorry? You took a big part in Difference Makers. Mm -hmm. What what could we do? In, what do you, in your opinion, what could we do to make this program more successful or even more like encompassing? I would like a pipeline to the NSF I Corps program. Okay. okay. I would also like assistance. Well, I guess the I Corps program kind of sets you up for SBIRs, right? Um, yeah. That mm, mentor matching opportunities with people on campus would be fantastic. I realize that that's not particularly easy because, you know, while there is a diversity of staff around here, coordinating with every single staff member is, you know, a huge a huge undertaking um but uh i think a pathway to i core would be great if we advertised it to um i would love to see more people competing whatever we can do to get people um in for outreach especially from engineering it'd be really cool to see some competition because there's some really bright people in um in the engineering department who are working on personal projects that could totally be directed into a difference maker, you know, program, really advanced control systems, um, uh, monitoring systems, IOT, uh, all sorts of like actuated servo projects, uh, not even to get into the lab projects that people are working on. I think it'd be really cool. For example, last year, um, one of the people who competed uh, was my coworker uh, Vassal. He his team was developing um, plastics from or hydrogen from plastics. Remember that, yeah. And that company is, I think that's company still doing really well. Um, but other seeing more folks from engineering would be really cool and would make it you know more competitive, stakes higher, which would be more fun. Anybody got any other suggestions? Hey, Brian, I, I I initially had no answer to this because I've never seen, you know, I've never seen a pitch competition or, or, or anything like this ever outside of UMass Lowell. I think Difference Maker is the first of its kind. I, I think if we, if we, it, it's one thing to wish, wishful thinking is to want to have more students involved. I think if we want to start small and sort of, actually push forward and get maybe some effort to maybe make a change would maybe push out to the other UMasses and see if we can get students from other UMasses to compete and do a bigger UMass difference maker. Um, I, I think I think definitely students would be more interested. It's just a lot of UMass Boston students aren't aren't informed. You know, I, I will tell you that the, there was a couple of people I met in the very beginning who had this idea and one of them was to be on this phone call. And the other one is uh, was a previous chancellor, and, and they were very, very wise in coming up with this idea. So, so I agree. 
There, there are some other programs kind of like it, but you're right, it's, it's a unique program. Um, and, and so, you know, that gets more into the marketing side. It's, we need to market a little bit more and, and then more other students come into the, into the deal and maybe more universities come into the deal. And then who knows what happens after that? So that's a great idea. Anybody got anything else? Is there anything you would, would like to get rid of about Difference Makers? You can't say David. No, don't say that. <laughs> I'm kidding, David. <laughs> I have an answer to your previous question. Okay, let's do it. So one of my like absolute favorite things about Difference Maker was the time like in between judge deliberations after your pitch in both semifinals and finals, when you just like had time to walk around, like see other people's projects, talk with them, whatever network, especially during the semifinals when there was like 35 uh, poster boards to see, like just that kind of stuff somewhere in between competitions would be cool just to like see what everyone's up to and talk to them and whatever. And like everyone here, if it was in person, it would be better. Obviously, I understand there are logistical issues. Like everyone here needs to interview people. And that's like one of the hardest part is finding people to interview. I don't see why we can't like all interview each other. So if there was more times where we would all like interact like that, it would make that a lot easier and we could all get a lot out of it. So I'm kind of hearing from few of you you'd rather this all be in person rather than virtually yes yeah okay that's i mean it is a logistics challenge but you know mm -hmm. come september we're all coming back to school right yeah 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 i'm having another is a good compromise yeah. for that say that one more time please i mean demo days are pretty good compromise for that right that's two weeks from now, one week from now. Yeah. Yep. We can all see each other there. Is everybody going to be there? Of course. Yes. I wouldn't miss I it do need to get on another call in a couple of minutes. But mm -hmm. first of all, I'm very, very proud of what you all are doing. And I'm so happy that you can do it. And, you know, you, everybody, I think, has my email. If not, David certainly can share it with you all. Oh, I am... I think mean, as David and Steve both are very interested in hearing what you have to say about how we can make the program better, um, you know, whether it's bigger, smaller, longer, faster, you know, we'd love to hear that because we are looking at, like any, any business you're at, you, we're always looking at ways to improve it. And nobody can tell us more about that than y'all. So if you, if you have ideas, uh, please share it with either me or Steve or David or whoever you want or all of us. Um, we, 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 we are absolutely interested in making this program more successful, more sustainable and, uh, and, and make it better and, and then eliminate anything that isn't productive. Mm -hmm. Everybody have a great day. Thank Brian, you. Thank you. Thank you. Great okay. to see thank you. you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I'll stick around for some questions if anybody has them.